Morning, Berean. Guys, who has power? Who doesn't? Power doesn't. We're praying for you. It was awful. We didn't lose power at all, praise the Lord. But uh, yeah, there was a little, we had a few rabbit problems at, at home. So we have a lot of work to do this morning in the book of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to pray. We'll recap. We will get into it. Amen? Awesome. Let's go. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the scripture that gets to reveal who you are and what you're about. Lord, I pray for myself that you would hide me behind the cross. Let the people of God hear the word of God and nothing else. Lord, I pray that the word would do, Lord, we need the word to do the work. And it's in Jesus' good name. Amen. So if you're new, if you're just watching online, if you're not familiar, you're just catching up, this is the on-ramp into the book of 1 Corinthians for you. I'll recap where we've been. So we're in this book, and this is a little church with big problems. Little church, big problems. Now, we find out that discipleship, when you come to Jesus, is a messy process. You don't have it all together. You're not... You're not instantly sanctified. There's justification and sanctification, and that sanctification is a process. Amen? Amen. Now, God saves messy people. Amen. There is no one so messed up, no one so jacked up that Jesus can't save you. So if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord, you don't know Christ as your Savior, and if you're watching online, let today be the day of salvation. Today be the day that you repent of your sins and trust in Christ. Now, God in his kindness, when we come to Christ, makes us more like himself. Like I said a moment ago, we become progressively more sanctified. The more and more we become like Jesus. Now we find out with this little church with big problems, uh, God correcting bad Christians, that one of the big problems they were having was division. Everyone had their team jersey on. Some was, of, some was of Paul, some was of Cephas, some was of this guy. Everyone has their own team jersey. Now this division... Paul says it was because they were thinking worldly. They were worldly. They were not thinking spiritually. They were not thinking like Christians should think. And what they were doing was they were acting like they were worldly. Now, here's a really interesting observation with sin. Sin never stays contained. Sin never stays contained to one area. It's like a cancer. Eventually, if you have cancer in one area and you don't deal with it, eventually this is going to spread to the rest of the body. Eventually, it will spread all over and kill the person that has it. Now, this happens on two levels. This happens individually. If you don't put sin to death in your life, it will eventually kill you. A great quote by one of my favorite theologians, a man by the name of Dr. John Owen, um, He's in the 1600s, said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. This also, brothers and sisters, happens on a corporate level too. This happens to churches. Churches that are lax on sin eventually die. Amen. Eventually die. Now, we find out that division in this church is not their only problem. We're going to be in chapter 5, we're going to be in the whole chapter today, and we find out in our section of a horrifying situation that Paul knows about and has to deal with with this church. Let's go ahead and in our normal fashion, let's read the text and we'll pick it apart like we normally do. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For although, it, although absent in body, I am present in spirit. And if, in, and if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has done such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know the little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old lump, that you may be a new lump, as you are really are unleavened for Christ. Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to be out of the world. But I am now writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I... For what have I to do with judging the outsiders? Is it not those outside the church who are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. The word of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Now, we find out, let's look at the first five verses here. So what's going on in this text? Well, there's a situation going on in this church. And there's two parties described. There's the man and there's the church. Now, the man situation, uh, there's a situation going on over here, and there's a situation with the church. Now, every time I have heard this text taught, most of the time they have focused on the man, the individual. I would make the argument that the, that the thrust of Paul's argument is not the man who is, who is having a problem right here. I'm being very delicate with the way. I have prayed about this text, guys, okay? For months, I've talked to my guys on Tuesday like, guys, I'm nervous about this text. I'm nervous of where this is going to go. And I'm praying, so work with me here. So the two parties involved, let's deal with the man first. What is he doing? Well, he's having a sexual relationship with his stepmom. Now, Paul, an important observation here. Paul makes the observation that this isn't tolerated even amongst the pagans that they live next to. When the pagans have a better morality than you, something is really, really wrong. Something is really bad. Now, if this is bad for their culture, imagine how bad it would be for their church. But they're so, it's so far rotten, so far problematic, that, that it's just... It's bad. It's bad. The church should, Paul says here, you should rather mourn. This should cause the heart of the people of God to mourn. Now, there is an application here, and I need to be pastoral, and I need to be firm. Normally, when we think theologically, we think, I, Sometimes when we think theologically, we think abstractly and we don't think that this is applicable to our situation and applicable to our culture. And I want to be pastoral and I want to be firm. This situation currently is going on, not in our church, but in the world around us. This disgusting situation that we're seeing here goes on in the world around us. Now, and this is to our shame. Our American culture is so rotten to the core that this type of situation is in the fantasies and minds of the pagans around us. Business Insider publishes keyword searches of illicit websites. And I've been a subscriber to Business Insider since I was in college. But they publish keyword searches, and this is one of them. Our culture is rotten to the core, brothers and sisters. Our culture needs the gospel, and our culture needs to repent. Now, let's look at the church's response. The church's response is honestly way worse than this man's individual sin because it implicates the entire church that they tolerate this nonsense. Now, several commentators I read this week had reasons why they were tolerating this. First one was because they were too busy fighting in their own factions. They didn't care about holiness. This problem, brothers and sisters, when theology, I love theology. I have a theological library in my house. It's full of books. I get book deliveries quite regularly. And my wife looks over and she laughs sometimes. She's like, another one, another one, another book. And she's, she's smiling. She's like, yeah, that's true. That's... Now, Here's the thing, if theology is nothing more than a mental ascent for you, take your books and throw them in the garbage. If it's just a mental exercise and it doesn't go from head to heart to hands, throw it away. It's not helping you. 
theology, our theology, what we believe about God should impact our hearts so much that we feel the depths of our depravity and then we have great joy in Jesus so that we would put sin to death and love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Your theology should not give you any chutzpah to where you're like, I'm awesome. That's ridiculous. We should be putting, this should cause us to be holy and this should cause us to be honestly This should cause us to mourn. Now, the second reason why the commentators I was reading said that they were tolerant of this man's sin is because they were overusing the grace of God as a cover for sin. Romans 6 talks about this. It's not in my notes, but Romans 6 says, "To, to use the grace of God as a cover for sin, God forbid. Now this happens, why this happens is when we misunderstand what the grace of God is and if we use it for a license to sin, what that says is we don't understand the grace of God. Now, Paul says here that they're arrogant. Might I suggest to you that the tolerance that, that's happened in, I would say evangelicalism, praise God, it doesn't happen in our church, but evangelicalism as a whole where they're like, we're tolerant, we don't care, we're whatever, grace, God gives grace to everyone and it's just, it's good. And you can live however you want to is a false gospel. We see this, I seen this on my way in this morning, right? I passed a church on our street, I won't point them out, but you can see it because they have a rainbow flag in front of their church, you know, hint, hint, down the street, that... They're tolerant, they're accepting, they're arrogant because they don't believe what the scripture says. Now here's the truth. You don't, let me be honest with you. You don't ever, should, you should never believe anything I tell you because I tell it to you. Not because of who I am, but because of what this word says. Literally my whole job as a pastor is like a mail, like a mail delivery guy. Like I show up, deliver the mail, this is what God said, I get to go home. That's how it works. Like, if, if there's anything new, like, if you create a new doctrine that no one's seen in 2,000 years, congratulations, you've discovered heresy, which is very old because somebody's probably come up with that idea before you. Now, Paul has instructions for this church in the next section. He says, for though I am absent in body, I am present and I've already passed judgment on this. Paul has passed judgment on the man who's, who's, who's caught in this sin. Now, I want to point this out. This is a clear indication that Christians should judge. This is a clear indication. We should judge, but we should judge biblically. If something is sinful, you can say, that is sinful, knock it off. Completely acceptable. Now, the thing is, you just got to make sure your judgment is biblical. And not just some audio offer a preference thing like, I prefer this, I don't prefer that. No No one cares what you prefer, we care what the Bible says. Now, Paul gives instructions as to what this church should do. He says, remove the man sinning from the assembly of God. Remove the man. We need to cut this cancer out. This is the process of church discipline, which we will get into here in a moment, in action. This is removal from church membership. Paul has this in mind when he says, hand him over to Satan. Real Christians, when robbed from When real Christians being barred from church membership, from fellowship, from the Lord's table, which we're going to celebrate later on, real Christians, that should bother your soul. Now, why is this man to be removed? Because he is an open, rebellious sin and professes to be a Christian. There's a categorical difference between a non-Christian and a Christian. One Christian that's sinning, you're an apostate. Uh, that's, you're continuing in sin, that's apostasy. If you're not a Christian, that's different. Now, Paul's response to this man, now I've, I've said this with church discipline, I've said this with uh, church membership. His response to this man only makes sense if you keep two Christian truths in tandem, two Christian doctrines in tandem. First, church membership. I want to ask a question here. What is church membership? 
Church membership. Now, I want to point this out before we get into church membership. You can't talk about church discipline apart from talking about church membership. They go hand in glove. It's the same thing. You can't have one without the other. I remember I was, I was sitting, I was having coffee with a pastor. And I won't tell you where, I won't tell you when. But I was having coffee with a pastor. And I remember he was planting a church. And I looked at him dead in the eyes. I'm like, I was looking to plant a church at the time. I had notes, pencil. How are you doing church discipline? Okay, we're going to do church discipline. How are you doing membership? We're not. What? So you're going to do church discipline, but not membership. How is that going to work? So you're going to build a house, no walls, but a roof. And it's going to magically stay there. No, it's going to collapse and you're going to make a cult. That's, that's how it's going to unfortunately work. Now, also, I want to say in our definition of church membership, which I will read here, when I say membership, I don't mean membership like AAA. I don't mean membership like you got a Netflix subscription. I don't mean membership as in like you're a member of AARP or any of those things. When I say member, I'm using biblical imagery of like members of your body, right? If somebody, I, I knew someone that lost a limb. They lost a limb. I knew several, I've known several people that have lost limbs. One lost a limb in a car accident. One lost a limb to cancer. And how they described it was being dismembered. Dismembered. A piece of their body, which should have been there, was removed. And it was a very, very traumatic experience for them because they lost a portion of their body. This is the imagery. We biblically are the body of Christ when one mem when someone has to, when someone is sinning to the point where they, they, their profession of faith no longer looks legit, you cut them off. It's like the cancer that you have to dismember them. And it's not a good thing. And this is something that should cause us to mourn. Now, Definition of church membership. Church membership is the formal relationship between a local church and a Christian characterized by the church's affirmation and oversight of the Christian's discipleship and the Christian's submission to living out his or her discipleship in the care of the church. Let me read that again. It's a little bit slower this time. Church membership is a formal relationship between a local church and a Christian characterized by the church's affirmation and oversight of a Christian's discipleship and a Christian's submission to living out his or her discipleship in the care of the church. Notice, there's some several elements that are present in this. The church, bodily formal, the church body formally affirms the individual's profession of faith and baptism is credible. It promises, the church promises to give oversight to the individual's discipleship. The individual formally submits his or her discipleship to the service and authority of this body and its leaders. I borrowed this, just in case you're Googling this definition, I borrowed this from Nine Marks, uh, from the Nine Marks website. I think this is great. This, I think this is a great definition. I just want to give credit where credit is due. Now, this is very important. Membership, discipline only works with membership. Now, I want to give you guys a little bit of biblical support for church membership. Mind you, this is all over the New Testament. The New Testament assumes church membership. It assumes it. It assumes healthy Christians are going to be plugged into churches that you are covenanting together to be a formal member of that you're not going to church hop. I mean, church hopping in the New Testament would have been extraordinarily difficult. Let's just, church is 500 miles here, 500 miles there. You're not probably going to do that in a week, in a Sunday. You're not going to be like, hey, I'm in Galatia this week, or hey, over here. It, it, it wouldn't work in the New Testament. Now, first text, Acts 2.41. For those who received his words were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Very interesting and very curious here. When, when Luke tells us that 3,000 people were at it, you know what that assumes? They knew who was in and who was out. They knew who, was at, who were added to the church. They knew who were not in the church. And there was a registry. They knew who was there. They knew who the sheep were in the church. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls 
as those who would have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, if God is going to keep, this is, this is a text for me. Let me be honest. The members of our church, me and the elders, keep watch over your souls. This text haunts me at night because I know I'm going to have to give an account for every single member of Berean. Amen. And it's a joyful work. Now, I want to point this out. If God is going to keep pastors accountable for sheep that are members of their church, there has to be a criteria of who is in and who is out. There has to, we have to know whom we're accountable for and because we know who we're accountable to. Does that make sense? Are you guys trekking along with me? This is extraordinarily important because we're going to see here in a moment, not a lot of churches do this. Not a lot of churches do membership. Not a lot of churches do uh, discipline. Yeah, that, that's unheard of in evangelicalism. But here's a good question. How do you become a member of a church? How do you become a member of a church? I mean, we're talking about church membership, talking all this other stuff. How do you become a member? Well, there's two ways. First is baptism. If you're born, baptism is the gateway into the local church. That was the, that's the right of entry. Not right as in like, this is your like Miranda right, but right as in ceremony to get into the church. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. That is a, that is a public profession of your faith in Jesus and entrance into the church. The second way is through covenanting together. Sometimes these happen at the same time. Like if we baptize you here, we're having a baptism class and membership class here, which I'm going to plug here in a moment. But when you're baptized, you become a member of our church. It's the, it's the same class for a reason. Now, covenanting together is where you affirm your desire for membership. Now, other churches, I'm going to be straight with you. Other churches, this looks different. This looks different and that's okay. Some churches, you take a class like ours where we want you to have full disclosure. This is what you're getting into. We got warts here, here, and here. Every church has problems, including ours, and God's working through it. Now, some have you come forward. Some are like, hey, there's none of that. You just come forward. You affirm your membership. I mean, whatever that process looks like, the church has the ability to, to regulate that. Now, with affirming your... The, the key portion here is affirming your desire for membership. There is no such thing as common law membership, like common law marriage, where you shack up together for however many years and you eventually become married in the state size. Not really true. Uh, if you're shacking up, you should repent. Uh, here's the point, though. Just because you go to a church doesn't mean you're a member of that church. You have to affirm your desire for membership. That's very important. You have to covenant together with to be considered a member. Now, here's another question. How do you become a member of Berean? I mean, this is my sales pitch right here. How do you become a member of Berean? Well, we take people through the same class for baptism and membership class, which we're having on March 12th. So if you're interested in either baptism, like you met Jesus and you've not been baptized, we had a class for that. If you're interested in like, hey, I love Berean. I'd like to covenant together and be formally like in Berean. We got a class for that. It's the same one. You don't even have to, you don't have, there's not two, there's one. Now, what we go over in this class is we go over the doctrinal statement, constitution, so you know fully well what you're getting into. There's no secret like behind door number three. There's none of that. There's, you know what, what we believe, what we expect, all of these things, our responsibility as elders to you, your responsibilities as a Christian to walk faithfully with Jesus. You know what, all of it, all of it, you know all of it. So if you're interested in that class, March 12th, come see me, love to sign you up. Now, once we looked at church membership, now we have to ask the question, what is church discipline? What is church discipline? The process, and this is, my, this is a definition, process by way of restoring a wayward believer to following Jesus. It's a process by way of restoring a wayward believer to following Jesus. This is important. Now, I want to be extremely, extremely clear with this. Church discipline is not punitive. 
Church discipline is not punitive. It is not where you're trying to harm another person. You, it is only that it is not a form of punishment. You're not going to get flogged. There is none of that. Church discipline is the restorative process by which you call someone to Jesus, back to, back to their faithfulness in Christ. The moment someone repents, they're welcomed and embraced, open arms. That's how it works. It's not punitive. We have to keep that in mind. Have to keep that in mind. And it's restore them so the moment that they repent of their sins, they're forgiven without hesitation because Christ has forgiven us much. Amen? Now, I do want to point this out. Most churches in evangelic evangelicalism don't practice church discipline. Goodness, most churches don't even practice church membership in evangelicalism. Now, I want to ask the question, why? Because we're discussing this. Why most churches don't do this? Well, it's easy to go down the street to another church, right? You could look at your phone right now on Google Map and be like, there's a church here, 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 and here. There's more churches probably near us than McDonald's are. So a lot of churches don't want to ruffle feathers and say, well, they'll just go to another place. Well, we, we have to do church discipline if we want to be, be biblical, now, the other reason I think churches don't do church discipline is because it's hard. Church discipline is a hard process. And let's just be honest here. Most evangelicals, our church is incredibly special. Most evangelicals don't give a rip about the Bible. And that's the our shame. That's the our shame church. Most evangelicals churches are nothing more than a cool TED Talk sermon with a guy wearing skinny jeans Every jeans I wear become skinny jeans because I'm fat. That's just the truth. Um, <laughs> don't get any men's on that one. It's like, hey, you probably should just lose a few LBs. But here's the point. Cool Christian sermon, TED, TED Talk sermon, Christian rock band, smoke machines, cool trendy foyer coffee. They never get into the hard meat of the truth of the scripture. You handle the scripture, it's like handling a blade. It will cut you. And it's important that it does. It prunes. I remember I was sitting in a, this, this goes along with the whole church discipline thing. I remember I was meeting with pastors at a church planting event. It was a church planting training. I remember there, I remember I had my notebook, I'm this, I'm really noty. Like if, like if you ever have a meeting with me, I probably have a notebook and I'm probably writing stuff down. I remember I was sitting there with a group of pastors and I was like, hey guys, how are you doing church discipline? Last guy disappointed me. How are you guys doing it? Maybe there's someone that owns a Bible that could tell me how you, guys are, how you guys are working through this. I remember everyone without hesitation looked over and said, we're not. We're not doing discipline. Why? They don't care. They don't care. That's the whole reason. They don't, a lot of them just didn't care. And a lot of them honestly were like, well, the Holy Spirit will discipline his own people. And I'm like, what about that in 1 Corinthians 5 where that dude needed to be disciplined? I mean, Paul showed up was, was the emissary by which the Holy Spirit was kicking this dude out of the church. We need a few of those. Now, and it's to our shame. Now, here's a question. I said, church discipline is a process. Well, what's that process? What's that process look like? Well, this process is kind of laid out in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, verses 18 to 15. Let's look at them. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church and refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now look at the steps laid out here. There's several steps. There's private confrontation. If you catch someone in sin or someone sins against you, you go right to them. It do, you don't gossip, for goodness sakes. You go right to the person. You got a problem with me? You come to me first. You got a problem with someone else? You go to that person first. You don't go to 10 other people. You go to one. Got loose lips sink ships, gossip kills churches. Go to that person. Now, you have a, if say you go to that person, they don't repent. They're like, no, I'm not going to stop. 
We got to have a witness confrontation. You bring someone else with you. Finally, now, okay, now you only one or two other people. It doesn't, no more than that. Now, these witnesses don't necessarily need to be witnesses of the event in question. I would make the argument, and many other theologians would make the argument, these could be ex people functioning like expert witnesses. Like, for example, let's use the situation we're dealing with here in 1 Corinthians. Hey, this guy's having a relationship with his stepmom that's not improper. Let's bring two or three people to see if biblically this is improper. They're going to be like, yep, 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 you need to repent. That, it can be character witnesses. They don't necessarily have to witness the sin themselves. Then it becomes a public confrontation. Public confrontation. You tell it to the church, the assembly. This dude is sinning. This is bad. He needs to repent because we love him and his sin's going to kill him. We love him. A man, th this is, normally people think this looks, normally in our culture, we think, oh, this is harsh. You shouldn't, you shouldn't do this. Guys, let me be honest with you. My kids, this is, this is an example not in my notes. So JJ, my little seizure kid, has, <laughs> he likes to run everywhere. He runs like Mario. He's just running every which way. Run in the parking lot, run out in the street. I see JJ running in the street. I yell at the top of my, this is not me yelling. This is not me yelling. This is me yelling. I yell at the top of my lungs for my kid to come back. JJ, come back. JJ, come back. You know why? Because I love him. I love him, and I don't want him to get smushed like a, by a car. It's like Frogger. I don't want him to get smushed. Like, it's the truth. It's a public confrontation. You tell it to the church. This guy's sinning. We need to call him back to repentance. Now it's the whole pressure of the entire body on this person. And then you treat him like a non-believer if they won't even listen to the church. So what this means, functionally, is you remove them from church membership. You remove them because their profession of faith can no longer be assumed to be credible. Guys, Christians don't act like this. You should repent. Christians repent of sin. You're steeped in sin. What you're doing is wrong. You need to turn away. Now, note, I'm pointing this out here. When Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, Bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is a direct reference to someone being dismissed from church membership that they might not be saved. What you're saying when you remove somebody from church membership is that guy's probably not saved and it should break your heart when you do it. Now, you know when this process might differ? This, price, this process is... is Yes, it's biblical, but it's not necessary. There's biblical examples where people didn't follow this process. It, it, it's a little, there's a little bit of flexibility. I'll give you an example. If the sin is public, you don't necessarily need a pri private confrontation if the sin is public. Now, you can skip a few steps if the sin is public. Like Paul publicly confronts Peter in Galatians 2, 11 to 14. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with Gentiles. But when they came back, he draw back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically among with him. So even that Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, who is Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul completely broke through the first few steps. It was, it was a public sin, public confrontation. Meet it with, you meet force in kind with force. Like, if it's a public sin, public rebuke. Now, what sins can be disciplined? I want you to think about this. What sins can be disciplined? I get this question a lot, believe it or not. Theoretically, I'm just going to be straight with you. Theoretically, any sin can be a case for church discipline if the person is unrepentant. Now, practically speaking, Usually only the most obvious sins are the ones that are disciplined. Now, I'll give you some criteria for sins for church discipline. Now, each sin, each discipline case is taken individually, right? No two cases are usually the same. So this is general criteria 
that's like this is the sniff test. I, I had a really funny picture I was going to use, but I chose not to because this is a serious situation. But this is the sniff test. Well, the first thing on the criteria is one, it's obviously sinful. It's a clear-cut sin. It's not a question of, eh, like, like the dude in our situation, or the guy in our situation here in First Corinthians, First Corinthians five. He's he's having a relationship with a stepmom. That's clear. That's a problem. Like, it's no, there's no question here. There's no like, eh, maybe kind of. No, it's it's obvious. The next thing is it's provable. It's provable that it's sinful. Now, this kind of goes off to the whole obvious question, but. It's not potential sin, but actual sin. People do unwise and stupid things all the time, right? It's not a sin to eat a lawnmower, but like it's not overtly like, hey, you shouldn't eat your John Deere tractor. But it's just stupid. Like it's, gonna, it's, it's not going to be great going in. It's definitely not going to be great going out. Like it's just not a smart, wise decision. Now, there's many situations where people that are unwise, like people do unwise things. That's not a case for church discipline unless it gets really bad. Like, for example, um, the guy that likes to play video games, there's nothing wrong with playing video games in general speaking. I mean, you could be specific. But the guy's paying his bills. He comes home. He plays video games. Eh, whatever. I'm not, I'm not going to th- throw a fit. So obviously sinful, provable. It's provable sin. And then unrepentant. When confronted, they say, nope. I'm not repentant. I'm, this is righteous. This is what I'm doing. Well, that's a case for church discipline. I'll give you some examples that meet my criteria, meet the criteria here. One, teaching false doctrine. You come up, you start teaching like, like modalism or Trinitarian heresies. It's going to be a church discipline case. Like you start teaching false doctrine. That's pretty, that's pretty clear. Next one, like sexual sin, idolatry, stepmom relationships. That's clear too. That that's going to be a clear-cut case of church discipline. And I'll give you another one, which normally doesn't get as much attention as it should. Causing division in the body of Christ. That's clear-cut too. If you're whispering and murmuring and gossiping, that should be nipped in the bud soon. Now, what should the church, when, why should the church ultimately excommunicate those that are unrepentant? Let's look back at our text. Let's look back at our text at 1 Corinthians. It keeps the church pure. It keeps the church pure. Now, Paul says in verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul is using an illustration here from the Jewish Passover, where they will remove all the leaven, all the yeast, out of their house. Now, I want to point this out. Church, this purity of the church is a gift that God gives the church of the corporately and individually. Guys, if you have someone in your life that is willing to confront you with, if you're in sin, amen, bless them. I have good friends in my life that have open access to everything I view on the computer, everything I view on the phone, everything there. At a moment's notice, I could get a phone call to be like, hey, everything, open door, open door policy. You should have people in your life like that. And you should have, you should be praising the Lord that you have a church that actually practices church discipline that won't let you go wayward and won't let you pursue your own sin to your own destruction. Now, this illustration Paul is using here of leavening and yeast, yes, it's an illustration, yes, it's a callback to the Passover for purity, but I want to point this out here. I want to press into this illustration. Do you guys know how much leaven, how much yeast it takes to rise a whole loaf of bread? Very little. Very little. So one of the things people don't know about me, I mean, given how much stuff I post on Facebook, you probably should know this about me. I love to cook. I love to cook. I love fried chicken, pizza. That's why I'm fat. Like, this is the whole reason why I love love to cook. One of my first things I first made was pizza. There's a really great recipe from Alton Brown. You're the good eats dude. That, That guy... 
Well, the pizza recipe, you take a little bit of yeast, like a teaspoon of yeast for like four, like several cups of flour, and you let it slow rise overnight in the refrigerator. Covered, Covered yeah. Covered in the refrigerator, and it slow rises overnight. You know the only thing you need with just a little bit of yeast is time. With enough time, you could take a whole 20 some cups of flour, put just a little bit of yeast in there, and then give it enough time, it'll raise the whole thing. It'll raise the whole, whole, whole batch of dough. So how is sin like yeast? Well, it only takes a little bit, and the whole, it'll continue to go through, and it only takes time, it'll go through the entire church if left unchecked. If sin is left unchecked in the lives of individuals and the life of a church, it will proceed to go through. Like I use the example of cancer. If there's a little bit of cancer, eventually it's going to go through your whole body and it's going to kill you. Now, I want to point this out too. Paul says that this judgment for church discipline is very specific in, its, in where it's aimed. It's aimed at the church. The discipline is aimed at the church. Look with me at verse 9 to 13. 9 to 13. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people. And Paul clarifies this. Clarifies this. is crystal clear. Not meaning at all the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters since you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such of one. Don't have table fellowship with them. And this is the point I want to clarify too. When you're removed from under church discipline, you know what we bar you from? This. We bar you from the Lord's table. Not because we don't love you, but because we do, because we'll see in a moment when we do the communion service, when we do get into communion, if you do it un, in an unworthy manner, you put yourself in grave danger. Amen. Now, here, this judgment and this discipline is for Christians. Paul says that they should not associate with sinful believers. Now, there's an application for, here for us. There's an application. Those who confess Christ but live in a sinful way you should not associate with. You should put some distance there. And I'm going to be honest here. I'm going to be pastoral. This can be hard. This can be hard, especially if this is a family member that is walked, walking into sin. And you, you can go with tears in your eyes. Brother, sister, son, daughter, I really care about you. What you're doing is sinful. What you're doing breaks the heart of God. What you're doing is going to lead to your own destruction. Don't you see? Don't do this wicked thing before the Lord. What, what you're doing, purge the sin out. Repent, turn away. You go with tears in your eyes because you love this person, not because you're an arrogant jerk, but because you love them because you care. And if they pursue it, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't go with you any farther. I'm sorry. What you're doing is wicked. What you're doing is destroying yourself. I can't go with you. And this is really hard, especially if it's a family member, especially if it's a son or a daughter. This works itself out. I know there's gonna be a lot of questions, which we can discuss in small group. So who this judgment, so this judgment is for the church. Who's this judgment not for? The world around us. Paul is more concerned with the church than he is the world. God is going to judge the world. God is going to judge the world. I don't need to be the nitpicker of, of sin with the, the, what's going on out in the world. I'm going to call the world to repentance, yes, but I don't have to sit here and like, I don't, have, I don't need to raise my blood pressure over that. Why? Why is this not, the, why is Paul making this distinction? Well, we can't get out of the world. We're, the world is filled with sin and sinners and no one gets raptured instantaneously when you come to Jesus. So to, to, Paul says here, if, if you're gonna, if, if you're not gonna associate with anyone that's sinful, you would need to get out of the world and there's no way to do that. So there's no way to get out from the, this is the part of being in the world but not of the world brothers and sisters. We need to be in the world and not of the world. We need to be salt and 
light. Which goes to the other reason of evangelism. You should have non-Christian friends. You shouldn't be participating in their sin with them, but you should have non-Christian friends. You can have non-Christians over to your house. You can feed them meals. You can love on them. You can share the gospel with them. You can go and hang out with them, watch a ball game, do whatever, wherever you would go to talk to them about Jesus. You can be a witness to those people. And yes, their lives may be a train wreck, but you're bringing the gospel with you. That's a completely different situation than the other guy who professes to be a Christian, but clearly by his own actions demonstrates that he doesn't know jack about Jesus. That's a completely different situation. And we need to be wise. We need to be evangelistic with those people that are far away from God. Which kind of brings me into this. If you're here today and you don't know, and you're not saved, like you don't profess to be a Christian. Maybe you do profess to be a Christian. Deep down in your heart of hearts, you're like, I'm not a Christian. There's something really wrong. Let today be the day of repentance. Let today be the day that you turn away from your sins. You trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ in your place and for your sins. He who lived a perfect life, died a brutal death in your place and for your sins. Today's the day of repentance, brother or sister. Today is the day. Turn away and trust in Christ. And be a new creation. You get a, you get a new family, new everything. When you, it's the reset button to life. Let's pray before we transition to communion. Lord Jesus, your gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is sharp as any two-edged sword. And Lord, it prunes us and makes us better. Lord, I pray that your word and would stir our hearts to love you more deeply, to see you more clearly until we see you face to face. In Jesus' good name, amen.